And um, for those of you, uh, when we do take public comment, um, if you would raise your hand and then um, unmute yourself, we'll bring you in uh, to, the, to the call to ask your question. Um, and also if you're joining by phone, I believe you can use the star nine to raise your hand and the star six to either mute and unmute. Um, so we're gonna start with a uh, roll call. Um, and Mark, do we have someone to do the roll call or shall I do the roll call? Roll call? No, Allison could do the roll call for us and uh, the phone number 7204399 did raise her hand. So I have put them in to be able to speak. Okay. Salinas Fire District. City of San Rafael. This is Darren White on the 415-720-4399. Thank you. City of Larkspur. County of Marin. Present. Inverness PUD. Present. Kenfield Fire District. Present. Muir Beach Community Services District. Right, Nevada Fire District. Here. Sleepy Hollow Fire District. Present. Southern Marin Fire District. Present. Marinwood Community Services District. Here. City of Mill Valley. Here. Stinson Beach Fire. Town of Corte Madera. Town of Fairfax. Here. Town of Ross. Here. Town of San Anselmo. Here. A quorum is present with 12 members. Thank you, Allison. I appreciate that. Um, and just for the record, I believe um, Chief White from San Rafael, um, I thought I had uh, heard or received some notification that you were going to be taking the place of, um, of um, who was it? Um, Jim Schutz. Jim Schutz. Is that correct? Chief White? Can you repeat that question, please? Yeah, I just wanted for the record, um, I thought I had heard that you were taking the place of Jim Schutz on this committee. Is that correct? That's correct. That's been the case for a couple of months now. Okay, we'll make sure that we update our, our roster to reflect that. Thanks. Um, does, does anyone have uh, any agenda adjustments that they'd like to offer up? So hearing none, uh, this is now the open time for public expression. The public is welcome to address the operations committee at this time on matters not on the agenda that are within the jurisdiction of the committee. Please be advised that pursuant to the government code, the board is not permitted to discuss or take action on any matter not on the agenda. Comments may be no longer than three minutes and uh, should be respectful to the community. Um, so is there anyone that, uh, from the public that would like to address uh, the ops committee? Looking for any raised hands from our audience members. And there is no public comment. Thank you, Allison. Uh, so we will move to executive officers report. Mark. Good afternoon, everybody. And just a, a quick note for the minutes. Um, I do see that Chief Krakauer from Bolinas Fire has logged into the meeting. Good afternoon, George. Good afternoon. Um, so just a quick update. As most of you know, we had our board of directors meeting and the first step of our mission, vision and values strategic planning on the 21st. The video, the whole two hours and five minutes, if you'd like to watch it, is posted on the website so you can see uh, what went down. Um, most importantly for you guys, uh, Zone Haven, um, the evacuation management platform was approved for the use in Marin County. And um, many of you should have received an email today inviting you to the kickoff. And I think Charlotte will touch on a little bit of that with her report. Um, we did have um, 
um, the chair and vice chair from the ops committee attending the retreat for the um, for the board with the anticipation of not necessarily doing a full fledged retreat with the ops committee, but at least soliciting the same type of input from the ops committee and we'll be asking for the same from the advisory technical committee so that we can get input from all levels of the organization and all representation through the member agencies and building our mission vision and goals. I hope that uh, many of you have already noticed that you're receiving your disbursement checks from the MWPA for uh, the local mitigation projects as well as DSpace. Did want to clarify that those are all pass throughs. So there's no need for your agencies to invoice us for what activities you've been having. However, we do ask that in your budget or in your finance systems that you have an allocation in your budget system that shows that you received this money and then dispersed it for uh, your local mitigation projects or your DSpace projects. And it is up to the member agencies to track any reserves that they may have had uh, so that it can roll over into the next year. And we'll reconcile between uh, your finance staff and NWPA finance staff to make sure that we agree. And remember the whole goal about the reserves was that we would rather have member agencies spend money on quality products, projects, rather than just trying to spend money at the end of the fiscal year. We are in the middle of our recruitment for our planning and the program manager. It launched last week. It'll be flying until uh, February 22nd. We have a pretty diverse board of board that's scheduled for March 8th. Please feel free to share the flyer uh, with anyone you think would be interested in that. Uh, we are also working on our uh, draft RFP for environmental services. So. Um, the exec committee will be reviewing the draft that we have so far, providing feedback to me, and we hope to be able to push that uh, RFP for the environmental consultant out soon with the idea of bringing somebody on board as, as, as the ops committee is preparing your 21-22 uh, work plan that will have some environmental consulting firm support available for you. And for the member agencies, our intent is to include an option for the member agencies to use that same environmental firm for their local mitigation projects. It does a couple of things for us. It provides consistency in the way that the environmental compliance is done throughout all of the MWPA funded projects. And I think it'll take a workload off your staff. And so I think that would be appreciated uh, by the member agencies. And we would just need to build those project, those environmental compliance costs into the project costs. Finance committee is going to be getting spun up here uh, later in or early or mid February, which will um, build the budget amount for the um, core projects. And I'll touch on that more when you guys create your ad hoc subcommittee for finance. And um, ATC, the advisory technical committee, will be um, kicking off next week, um, approving their bylaws. And we're going to be asking them to do a similar process for any of the mission, vision, goals, values. End of my report, and I'm open to any questions from the committee. Any questions for Mark? Hey, Mark, this is Eric with Marin Wood. Uh, in regards to the first allocation payments, we did receive them, and thank you, it's helpful. Uh, and realizing that, you know, as approximately 55 percent are there updated annual projections kind of based on that initial 55 percent noticing that it didn't quite match up with the initial uh, uh, annual revenue projections we anticipate that it will actually be about one to two percent above projected okay so i just assume that's 55 percent and plan on that for the annual this year correct great thank you sir yep Any other questions for Mark? Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, hearing none, we're gonna move to the consent calendar. This is item number six. Um, oh, wait, I think, uh, help me with just the, uh, Mark, with the um, administrative side of this, do I need to go to public after your report? We typically have been. Okay, so let's do that. Um, if we could, Allison, go out to the public and see if there's any public comment on the executive officer's report. Looking for any raised hands from our audience members. And there is no public comment. 
Thank you. Uh, item number six, consent calendar. Um, we have one item there uh, for uh, approval of the December 3rd, 2020 minutes. Um, the minutes uh, are posted on the Marin uh, Wildfire Prevention Authority website. Um, and then also I asked Mark to send those out this morning, which I believe he did. Um, so uh, just looking to uh, move consent. Make a motion to approve, Ms. Zarek. Second. second, Jim Fox. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Let's, I, I think we need to go out to public comment just to see if we have any comment on that. I'm looking for any raised hands from our audience members and there is no public comment. Okay, thank you, bringing it back. We have a motion and a second, um, all in favor? Or do we have to do a roll? I guess we have to, do we have to roll call this, Allison? I believe so. All right, let's, Allison, if you could roll call, please. Okay, I will do that. I'm not, the, I'm not the attorney. You guys decide. <laughs> the Leading Spire District? Yes. City of San Rafael? Yes. County of Marin? Uh, County of Marin? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Jason, wake up. I, I couldn't find the mute button after okay. nine months. Inverness PUD? Yes. Kenfield Fire District? Kenfield Fire District will abstain. I didn't get the opportunity to, to review them uh, on the website. Nevada Fire District? Aye. Sleepy Hollow Fire District? Yes. Southern Marin Fire District? Yes. Marinwood Community Services District? Aye. City of Mill Valley? Yes. Town of Fairfax? Yes. Town of Ross? Aye. Town of San Anselmo? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you, Allison. Uh, so next up is item number seven. Uh, we're going to get an update on the evacuation plan study. And so um, I'd like to just introduce Charlotte Jourdain, who's been uh, managing this project for us, Charlotte. Um, and I believe you have a presentation you want to make as well. Yes. Um, thank you, Chief Tyler. Uh, let's see. Can you all see this? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Chief Tyler. Um, so um, the last time I addressed this group, um, I had developed an initial draft RFP proposal um, based on a prior grant proposal that I believe was developed by um, County DPW in conjunction with um, fire agencies. Um, there's been a slight change in direction since then, and I've also received a lot of um, feedback from this group, but also um, from academic groups um, following Jason Weber's suggestion that I reach out to um, um, academic um, you know, researchers in this field to get their um, opinion, but also um, experts in, in, in private companies to make sure that we are not including obstacles that would prevent um, interested parties from responding and that we are um, accur accurately describing the scope um, and whether it's realistic and feasible. So that's what I've been working on. Um, let me just start with a brief recap of MWPA's um, developing strategy on improving evacuations in Marin. So um, it looks to me like we have two tools to improve uh, evacuation um, or disaster evacuation. Uh, the first one, uh, you heard Mark um, discuss it earlier, it's the acquisition of the Zone Haven um, platform. That's a software, software platform that's going to help us um, or help you prepare, train for, and manage a live evacuation. Uh, it was approved on January 25th for a three-year contract. Um, the setup starts in February and is expected to complete in May. It's quite an extensive um, process, and I think the uh, added value to this is this multi-agency participation and collaboration between fire, law enforcement, OES, the Transportation Authority of Marin, Caltrans, CHP, and county and all the local DPW. So we're trying to be as inclusive as possible. We will also ask uh, our public information officers throughout the county to join us towards the end of the uh, setup or the Zone Haven implementation so that um, we can roll out the community interface. Um, so Zone Haven is a very interesting tool. It uses the quote, best available GIS data and models 
including uh, geographic features, topography, vegetation type and density, weather conditions, threat direction, structure, address count, population estimates and other demographics, traffic loads and road type, access to egress points, clearance times, etc. cetera. Um, one of the very uh, interesting, I think, feature of it is um, the ability to provide rapid simulations, whether during an event or in training. So um, the, the software can generate one, three and five hour models based on updated weather and fire data, and then spit out recommendation for evacuation zone sequencing. So as you can see, we can already do quite a lot of preparation and, and, and modeling in um, Zone Haven. Uh, I have to say, I've, I haven't seen it rolled out. Um, and I think a lot of us are waiting to see, um, you know, it's, it's very promising. We're just waiting to see exactly how we're going to be using it for training and so on. So the, the second tool which we're discussing today and that I've been working on for you is the idea of a risk um, evacuation risk assessment. So this takes um, sort of a lot a more preventative and planning approach um, in a, so a layer on on top of um, the tool that Zone Haven provides. And the idea is to look at um, all the risk factors that affect um, the, the, affect the, the risk um, during an evacuation. So essentially what we're trying to look at is to increase our chances of a successful evacuation should one occur. Um, in, in, in this context, the risk assessment is really the first steps toward any kind of mitigation effort. We just want a baseline idea of where we're at, uh, and we're looking at um, very physical factors, um, but also you know population demographic factors, presence of livestock, all sorts of things I'll be discussing in a little bit. Um, so the idea, just in a nutshell, is to quantify um, risk and risk factors. Um, prioritize them and implement um, mitigation efforts, and then go back and reassess and see how we've reduced risks or increased chances of success. Um, obviously, we, we were hoping for some sort of integration um, between these two tools. It's not defined at the moment, in part because Zone Haven is not yet um, deployed in Marin, um, but that is um, something we have in mind. So um, let me just take... Um, a quick seconds to discuss um, evacuation success, because I do want to point out that, um, you know, this is food for thought, so there's no need to respond or to comment on this, but um, I wanted to, to point out that we don't have a definition of a successful evacuation. I'm sorry, excuse me one second. I don't, we don't have a definition of a successful evacuation, um, but it, you know, to some extent, when we go out for a project like this and we're hoping for responses, and for proposals, it, it, might, it might be helpful in trying to communicate what it is we're looking to achieve. So I think, you know, to all of us, a successful evacuation is one where there's no casualties, no fatalities. Um, probably also, you know, a component regarding uh, minimum challenges to ongoing fire response activities while the evacuation is taking place. So I think that would cover everything related to ingress, um, emergency vehicle access, and all these other things that need to happen while people are getting out. Um, but then, then also, you know, I wonder um, whether, um, you know, can we, can we conceive of a measure where risk mitigation efforts essentially lead to more time to evacuate? Or can we measure it in, in terms of, you know, the time it takes to clear a zone, for example? I mean, again, just opening it up for, for a little bit of, um, of, of thinking here, because uh, it's something that, that people have been asking me, frankly. Um, so just um, stepping back, you know, the objective of this risk assessment, um, there is, there's a few. The first one is to identify and quantify all the risk factors that may affect the success of an, of an evacuation, excuse me. So we want the study to be very um, metrics heavy, quantifiable. Um, you know, there's a lot of qualitative data out there, but um, our, our goal is to work on, on risk and risk improvement and risk mitigation. So we need, we need some, some data, some, some, some qualifiables. Um, the second objective is to obtain a complete picture of risk, um, possibly through uh, some, some sort of visualization, like a heat map or something like that. And I'll let um, Jason and Mark comment on this, but my understanding is that from the perspective of the fire chiefs, this you know, would be something that um, would help um, with evacuation decisions, knowing that certain areas are more at risk overall than others. 
Um, on the other hand, we also want to obtain a more detailed picture of risk at different levels of aggregations and across different dimensions, because we need to prioritize funding and improvements by um, geographic area, could be the five um, geographic areas of MWPA or by jurisdiction, um, by risk or families of risks. We could say, you know, we, we have a grant, we want to improve or mitigate um, everything that's related to road conditions or everything that's related to vegetation. So we want to be able to use this tool to get reports by risk type and by um, levels of aggregations. And then finally, possibly the most kind of interesting um, aspect of this project is the ability to evaluate proposed or completed improvements. So we want to say, uh, we, we want to use this tool to say, okay, if we did this sort of vegetation work here, how would that lower our risk overall? Or if we change this intersection from a traffic light to a roundabout, I don't know, I'm just making this up, how would it impact our overall ability to um, increase our chances of of, of success and of things going smoothly. So, you know, this obviously is up for discussion. This is your project. I'm here for to get direction and feedback, but this is the this is how it's described um, currently. Um, of course, when we talk about risk factors, we do have to understand that we're, we're building something, um, but not all risks are created equal. So clearly there are some factors that can be improved upon in the short, medium or long term. So vegetation is a good example. Uh, road conditions, intersection, population preparedness. Um, but there are some factors that will need to be included in this tool, in this model, so we can understand the overall risk picture, but that we can't really mitigate, we can't really affect. So for example, we know that the, the more somebody, leave, um, somebody resides um, in a home, the less likely they are to evacuate early. We know that women are more likely to evacuate early than men, or families where children will get out early. We can't affect any of these factors. The current road network, we probably can't affect. However, we might be able to speak to future road um, network developments with this tool. Um, and of course, all of these risk factors are great, but they need, we need data to quantify them. We can't, you know, we can include everything we want. If there's no data to support it, it's, it's not um, going to be um, very easy. Um, let's see. Yeah, so prior research and incident reports is going to help us identify which risk to include and how to build this study um, or this tool in a, you know, showing that we've done our due diligence. Um, clearly, also, there is the idea of relative importance um, between the risk factors and overall on the success of the evaluation of the evacuation, excuse me. I know a lot of, you know, the tendency is to look, um, look at the list of factors in the RFP and you know, try to say, oh, this one's going to be more important than that one. But I really think we need to take a, you know, a step back approach. We don't know yet how these risk factors are going to be quantified, how they're going to be integrated with one another. And uh, we're not making any hypothesis. We're not saying one is going to be more important than the other. We need to let the consultants come up with methodology and um, let the data speak for itself, frankly. This is the work that we're commissioning here. It's an assessment and the results will tell us what um, the greatest risks are for us here in Marin. So um, going back to um, the, you know, the nuts and bolts of the RFP a little bit. Um, so there's some history there. Like I said, it started with a, a grant proposal. Now it's an RFP that, that's a little bit of a different format. Um, and when we go out for an RFP, as all of you know, um, some factors are up, are up to us, up to our control, and some are not. So um, what What's up to MWPA is to accurately describe the scope, the available data, uh, the required qualifications, and give a clear idea of the deliverables that we think we want. What's up to the consultant is to tell us what can be included, what risk factors can be included based on the data that's available and the methodology that's going to be used, what assumptions need to be made behind um, each of these factors, um, and what methodology they propose, and then to sort of circle back to the deliverables and say, with that, here's the deliverables we think we can provide. And then for us to decide, okay, that's going to work for us or not. So in the current draft, um, I think we have a really good handle on scope. Uh, we provide a preliminary list of factors. It's extensive. Uh, of course, we can always, uh, I'm happy to take any you know, comments or changes on exact wording just to be as specific as possible, but it is a preliminary list and the proposals, the response will indicate what can be included and what cannot. 
Um, we uh, need to work, I need to work a little bit further with probably with um, some of you to clearly identify which um, data sources are available. So we do mention um, the CWPP at the moment. Uh, we have a link to the TAM DM, which is their um, traffic um, demand model. Um, you know, LIDAR data, any other kind of data source that we can provide will help the consultant understand the scope of what we're trying to achieve. Um, so clearly this, this project is going to require quite some extensive data analysis and modeling experience. And I think that we, we need to be a little bit specific about the qualifications that we're asking for. So uh, I'm you know, working with um, various academic groups and people who specialize in evacuation and risk modeling to, um, to, to just kind of clarify that a little bit in, um, in the RFP. And for the same reason, I think that um, probably the selection process is going to need to um, entail uh, both a fire review and a scientific review. I think the fire, um, you know, the, we need to make sure that the fire, um, can, fire agencies get what they need and get a useful tool, but we also need a scientific review that tells us this model is going to stand. This project is, is you know, it's, it's solid, um, solid analysis and, and this is going to make sense. Um, you know, also just to remember that risk modeling and, and to some extent fire modeling as well, it's still it, it, in its infancy and we're not going out for an RFP for, you know, payroll services or something that people have been doing for decades. This is a completely new field. Uh, there's lots of new um, groups that are working on this, doing very in, um, interesting and innovative um, work. So, uh, we, you know, it, it just takes a little bit of definition and thinking about what we're, what we're asking for to make sure we get what we want. So the deliverables, they get their own slide. If I can switch slide. Uh -oh. Sorry. Oops. Okay, there we go. So um, the deliverables. So an assessment by definition is some sort of a picture in time. So we have the, you know, we have the choice. We can do a, a study and we can do it now, we can do it again in two years. Or we can try to build it more like a, a model with an interface that allows us to change scores as we go along with our improvements. And then, you know, we have something that's a little bit more flowing over time. Um, but yeah, one of the first uh, things I heard from you is um, this uh, request for a review of the literature and field reports on evacuation to, to, to show due diligence in including all risks to make sure that we're build, building a study that um, includes all possibilities and scenarios. Um, and I'll, I have some thoughts about that that I'll share um, afterwards. Um, the, the meat of it is really this risk assessment tool. And what that looks like is um, essentially multiple layers of GIS and other data that are integrated into a single platform. Um, so of course, when we say, you know, software platform or application, it needs to be hosted and maintained somewhere. Uh, it needs to have a user-friendly interface with proper training and documentation so that registered users can go in and change the scores of um, proposed or com completed improvements, um, which would feed into the visualization and you know, change, change the, the overall picture of risk every time an improvement is completed. And then we need reports, um, report features so that we can um, issue you know, reports by risk and by area and so on. Uh, and then, of course, we ideally we'd like this to be um, to integrate with other platform. Um, you know, I, I think Zonehaven. I've talked to them about this project. They're very interested, but you know, we have a three-year agreement with them. We don't know if they're going to bid or not. We we have to build this. We can't tie ourselves to just one um, platform. Especially in this case, it's a it's a private company. It's one of the only ones in the market. We don't know what it's going to be in in three years. Um, and then, um, you know, in addition to the model or the platform, I think we want a report that explains the methodology and the assumptions behind um, the assessment so that if some of these assumptions don't make sense, again, uh, we can be modified. There's some documentations about um, how this has been done. And then, you know, up to you if you'd like um, or if the board would like a final presentation at the end of the project. Um, let's see. So in terms of timing, Give me a second here, but I think. Sorry. Yeah. 
So in terms of timing, um, like I mentioned, the Zone Haven implementation starts soon in February and is expected to finish in May. I really recommend that we wait and see what's going to be done in Zone Haven in terms of modeling um, and um, with what data. As I said, they, they use the best available data. It might be that we have some data that they can include. So then we don't have an overlap between the two um, projects. Um, I think I've already discussed Ingress um, and EVA. It's, it's a good example. I think Zone Haven can model uh, routes under a lot of different uh, traffic and fire scenarios, but the risk assessment in my, my view would be more something that looks at um, road width, turn points, pitch, point, pinch points, any kind of physical characteristics that can be improved upon. But you know, it's a little bit of a, of a gray thing there. So we, we have to wait for the two to, for, for Zone Haven to, to, to land somewhere so we can see what it's like exactly. Um, the setup of Zone Haven is also a very important multi-agency effort. And I think if we wait, that's going to benefit the risk assessment um, project overall, because we'll have all these stakeholders already talking using a similar vocabulary around evacuation zones and so on. And I think that's gonna benefit this project. Um, I also think I'm, I'm only at the beginning of um, outreach in academia. There is a lot of interest. Um, people are um, talking, they're talking with one another, they're talking, private uh, organizations are talking to academic groups to see if they want to partner. So there's, you know, just a lot, uh, time will help. Time is going to be on our side on this to get us quality bid. So my projected um, timeline would be, I think, potentially a release in April, shortly before the um, completion of the Zone Haven implementation with responses in June. And so that we can have a selection um, before the summer, but you know, that might, that might um, change depending on your feedback. Um, last slide. Um, as soon as it turns. Yeah, so uh, next steps. So currently the draft RFP is closed for review. That's because um, I just have too many inputs that are not integrated in the current uh, version. I don't wanna send it out there and create um, confusion. But you know, I'm hoping that um, today there's time for a little bit of a discussion uh, and then that I'll get some direction from Chief Weber and Mark Brown on um, modifications after today's update. Uh, my proposal, my suggestion would be to continue vetting um, this project with experts. Um, I've contacted, there's many people, um, I'm, I'm speaking to three more um, next week. So you know, just need a little bit more time on that. Um, identify more clearly what data is available um, determine required qualifications, determine the need for a selection panel, observe the Zone Haven implementation, and then once I have a new draft, it'll go to you for review. Then I believe, Mark, it has to go to the executive board for review, and then we can release and at that point really continue outreach with the goal of obviously getting you the best quality bids that we can get. So that's all for me. Thank you very much. I'll take any questions. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, if you can, here we go. Yeah. Very much appreciate that. So any questions right now from uh, committee members for Charlotte? Um, I know there's a lot of folks that have um, participated, uh, gotten their eyes on this as well as the experts. So um, any comments from anybody now on, on where we're at with this? Yeah, Bill, uh, sorry, from Chris. Go ahead, Chris. Looks uh, like Chris. Uh, just uh, Alan Piombo just reminded me. Hmm. Go ahead, go ahead, Chris. Your your uh, your uh, screen kind of froze up there. Try again. Okay. Can you can you hear me now? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, sorry. So Al uh, Piombo reminded me that this past year, uh, Mill Valley had been working with Google under an NDA. And uh, as a result of that, um, uh, that study, they've, they've created a published paper, which I'll send to Charlotte, uh, sort of in reference to her looking for some other academic connections. So an academic paper, uh, I think that has some good case study stuff in it. I've not read it yet, but I'll get that to you, Charlotte. Thank you, appreciate it. Yeah, I would just uh, suggest not widely publicizing the company name, but just re refer to whatever material is available in the public journal without uh, 
Yeah, no, that's a very uh, that's a very interesting resource. I was reading an evacuation study that was performed by um, some um, a group at UC Berkeley on Kensington. That's a five six thousand uh, you know residents there, and they went street by street to examine the condition. They they did a whole lot of data gathering, taking pictures of gutters and you know speed you know bumps and and nicks in the road and so on. Obviously, that's not something we can do very easily here. So so this is, will be this will be very good, very helpful. Anybody else have questions for Charlotte? Okay, Charlotte, I have a question. Um, regarding the risk assessment tool that you were talking about, you mentioned that uh, one of the deliverables was that there was the ability to change the score um, if there was an improvement that was made. And I'm wondering, um, is it also envisioned that the, the score could change in the other direction. That is, um, you know, what if a community decided to install traffic calming, let's say, in some form or fashion that that improves the the livability in 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 some respects for that community, but it but it might work against trying to move people out, you know, in an in an uh, egress mode. Or or let's say it's taken into consideration the the number of homes or population in a given area. But let's say a project gets approved to add, you know, additional housing units, for example, um, in an area, and and potentially increases the burden on the streets for, you know, and, and can, will there be the ability to to show uh, the change in score going the other way? Uh, yeah, help thank you. make decisions. Yeah. yeah, that's a that's a that's a great comment. Actually, I, I hadn't thought about it, um, so I'll, I'll make sure to include that. I do think that there's a difference between um, changing the score or building a scale that can go up or down and then needing additional data to be able to quantify a risk. So if there's a new community that develops, we would need to input into the model at least some sort of plan about, or some sort of data about the number of housing units, you know, the road networks and so on. For, for some things it might be, you know, we might be able to just work with the, uh, the score scale but for others, we'll need additional data. So, you know, but I'll, I'll make a note of that. And that is something that we can discuss during the vetting process with the, uh, with the consultants on how they envision that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. any, any of the other uh, panelists have questions? Okay, seeing none, let's go out to public comment. Um, Allison, if you could check. Larry Maniquez, you may unmute yourself for public comment. Charlotte, thank you. Uh, that was really an excellent presentation. I've got a couple of, you can't really answer my questions, but I'll. Uh, I apologize. I moved. Whoops. I, I... Hold, hold on. I lost my notes. Let me just grab my notes. I can continue on as soon as I find them. Here they are. Okay. Um, will this modeling allow you to be time specific? So to, uh, differentiate between commute hours, school hours, and evening hours, for example. And uh, because it's a, a new tool, risk modeling and, and fire modeling are really new tools and it's a new field, um, we can expect it's an inexact science. It's kind of what you were touching upon. So the, the question is, has Zone Haven been put to use as a tool during the actual evacuations? And were there quantifiable results that the board could look at to give an idea of uh, how accurate uh, it might actually be in use. And um, for that, thank you so much. So I can't respond? No, I think you can respond. It's because okay. okay. it's an agendized item. So go ahead. Okay, okay great. Okay, yes, thank you very much for that comment. So, um, um, so I know that fire modeling um, in whether it's in Zone Haven or in the risk assessment tool, we're looking at building. As far as I know, the best fire models out there get updated several times a day with new weather data. It's not instant, you know, or by the minute. It's several times a day. That's the latest I heard from uh, from Berkeley and so on. Um, as far as traffic data, um, the transportation. My understanding from the Transportation Authority of Marin is that they have a model that will take into account the time of the day. 
Um, so, you know, how precise is it? Does it vary by the 20 minutes or half an hour versus, you know, general uh, range of time throughout the day? I can't tell you. Um, I think these, this is really a good example of something that's evolving very quickly. The, the science for this is evolving very quickly. Um, but um, yes, as far as Zone Haven being rolled out, it has been rolled out. It has been used for several um, live evacuations. In fact, Zone Haven is being used right now, Mark can correct me, for evacuation in uh, debris flow, right? In Santa Cruz area? Anticipated debris flows for San Mateo and Santa Cruz counties. Yeah, yeah. So they have a, a good track record of, um, of sort of live evacuation, vetting, and so on. Our next public comment will come from Lucy Dilworth. Hi, thank you for unmuting me or allowing me to speak. Um, one question I had about available data is um, the location of cell towers. <clears throat> um, I know that this is proprietary information, um, but I'm wondering if there's some arrangement that can, can, be, can be made with the providers under some confidential NDA um, that would give a location for each cell tower so that it can be modeled under different fire scenarios and alerts and warnings, <clears throat> uh, be, the, the efficacy of alerts and warnings would be understood better if the cell tower locations were understood. Um, yes, thank you for that. So um, there is a study right now going on in Bolinas with um, a group from UC Berkeley I was, um, I'm speaking with and I'm, I'm hoping to, you know, if not having them as respondents, at least involve them um, heavily in the review. Um, and they are considering the communication there. So they're using fire modeling um, outputs to feed into the communication model that includes um, cell phone receptions and so on. And then both of these feed into the evacuation model. So they're taking a kind of a broader approach to this. Um, but yes, cell locations is something that, um, you know, the, the risk of cell, cell cell phone communications going down would be one of the risk factors that we could consider um, including. I'm looking for any further raised hands from our audience members and there's no further public comment. Thank you so much, Allison. Charlotte, thank you again. We really appreciate that and we'll check in with you again uh, soon. Great, thank you. Thanks, Charlotte. Okay, so uh, next up is item number eight. It's our community wildfire protection plan. And uh, in the minutes from the December meeting, we had a very good uh, presentation that was provided to us by um, uh, Christy Neal and uh, also um, Tammy uh, from STI. But um, we just wanted to let the group know um, what the status is now. And so I've asked Todd Landau uh, to uh, just brief us with its current status, if you would, Todd, thank you. Let's see if I can find you guys again here. You guys, you guys see the CWPP? <laughs> we see the Fire Safe Marin page. Okay, you, you're good. I couldn't see which window I was sharing. All right, uh, so uh, um, I wasn't here for the presentation that Christy and Tammy gave you, but it sounds like you got a good overview of, of the, the document itself, the, the update process. Um, uh, you know, just to, the, the quick overview in case someone missed it, that's Community Wildfire Protection Plan in general. It, it's a document that we've been operating from for 16 years in Marin. I think 2005 was uh, the first uh, uh, plan of its kind published here. Um, it was updated in 2015, from 2015 to 2017, um, with the, the, the science-based approach that I'm sure Tammy and Christy covered in detail. Um, and the, the intent with the Community Wildfire Protection Plan is really that it be addressed and updated every five years um, at a minimum. Uh, and, and that's to, with the intent of capturing changes in development patterns and growth and, you know, changes in vegetation, um, changes in preparedness, actions that the community's taken should all be incorporated and reevaluated to see how those things are changing 
the, the fire landscape. So we've undergone um, the most recent update. I think in the 2015 to 2017 update was probably the most significant change uh, in the document that we're ever going to see with the application of the, the new science and wildfire modeling. Um, the, the significant updates here are really in the fine grained details. You know, we, we looked at uh, updating uh, the vegetation fuel models with a much more current up to date data. Um, and then the, really probably the, the biggest change that's going to impact the, the community in, in a lot of ways is the way we share this. So th this is what I want to point out. If you were to, if you're looking for the, the updated document since you were given the presentation last, it's been published at FireSafe Marin. Um, there's a link from the MWPA website, but the document itself is available in a PDF file. It's about 150 pages. Um, but, but we asked Sonoma Technology to give us a, a cleaner, easier way for the community and, and for the MWPA board, stakeholders, decision makers to look at the data. Um, I, they created something that's called a, a story map using ArcGIS tools. It's a great way to share complicated GIS data. Um, I, this, this is published at FireSafe Marin. You follow the links. You have the option to download the data, to download the PDF file, or look at the story map. I would suggest that you start with the story map, look at it. It's going to give you a view like this. In the left-hand column, you're going to see a summary of the text of the document. I, I apologize, it's really fine text here, but we're not reading it today. And it gives you an opportunity to scroll through, starting at the beginning of the document, and, and look at it, look at this document section by section, and and uniquely, the mapping data that's in the right hand column here is all interactive. This is the a view of the actual data in real time um, on the ArcGIS platform. One of the, the biggest uh, complaints, if you will, or questions that we got with, with the publication in 2017 of the last version of this. Was, was how do I zoom in on the maps? How, how do I look at my community? How do I see the data that you've collected in my neighborhood? Um, we got the, you know, those questions from uh, elected officials, from residents, and we didn't have a good way to share the data and certainly not share the data with the background information that's really needed to help people understand what they're looking at. And that's critical with this document. So all of the data is here in a, in a clean published format that allows you to zoom in take a look at your community with the, the necessary context in the left-hand column. Um, and and uh, every section and every map and every piece of data analysis that was created as part of this update is addressed here in the story map. I'm gonna take you to, real quick, to, I wanna wrap this up you know, in, in one or two more minutes, but um, two of the most important changes in the way we analyze data were we looked at a new, a new set of inputs for what we consider to be extreme uh, fire weather. Uh, when we first published the, the updated CWPP with this new wildfire modeling uh, and uh, you know, data approach in 2017, we did that the work on this between 2015 and 2017. It was adopted in February of that year and the North Bay fires had yet to happen. Um, you know, on the one hand, I think we all felt uh, maybe a bit of pride that, that Marin County had been ahead of the curve. We were taking this kind of approach before it was obvious to the rest of maybe the Bay Area and Northern California how important this was. But we, we looked at it and in 2017, what we considered to be extreme fire weather is not what we actually observed in October of that year. In fact, the conditions that we had used to model in this, the CWPP were downright mild compared to what we actually saw in Marin and Sonoma counties that, that night in October. So we knew really from within months of this being published that we needed to make an update and we needed to draw upon actual observed weather conditions. Um, so we took weather conditions uh, that were observed in Marin on in uh, early October 2017. We looked at weather conditions that we observed later that year in December when, when we saw red flag conditions for the first time in the month of December. 
We then again looked at uh, October of 2019 when the Kincaid fire was burning, where we saw even more extreme wind conditions in Marin, drier fuels uh, and, and lower humidities. And so we took an aggregate of those actual observed extreme fire conditions, which was a dramatic change for the worse compared to what we looked at before. Anyhow, what that gave us was a better approach, a better look and a more, I think a more accurate um, uh, you know, analysis of what extreme fire weather might actually be today in Marin. Um, <clears throat> when you, you look at this, you'll see it, the, the image in front of you is another good example. One of the, the realizations we made after the publication of the last document was that the color coding we had used to describe uh, flame lights, for example, might have been misleading to the community. We used a color palette initially that ranged from green to red. The green areas were areas where flame lengths were four feet or lower. Um, I, you know, all, all of you with the background in the fire service and probably just about anybody with uh, you know, a modicum of common sense understands that four foot flames are dangerous. But we had depicted them with green as the color and that was a soothing color and it gave the wrong impression. It gave the impression that there were areas in the county that might not be at risk at all of wildfire. That was not the case. Those areas were actually in some cases at significant risk. So simple changes to the display of the data, the, the color palettes we use, um, I, I think portray a more accurate picture. That this, uh, what you're looking at in front of you is a composite model looking at extreme fire conditions, but also considering things like population density, um, uh, uh, building construction, uh, but the fuel conditions in, in a variety of other inputs. So it's not simply the, the results of a model that might tell us what the flame lengths would be at any given point. And the final thing I'll, I'll point out, we, we I can't, I'm afraid I'm gonna break it if I zoom in on this, but what you're looking at here is a parcel level fire hazard assessment. Um, this was not included in our analysis in the, the 2017 document. And uh, th this, what you're seeing right now is just published, hot off the presses. It's the first chance that you and the community will have to look at this. It's important that when you look at the parcel level hazard assessment that you go in depth and read the description of what this analysis means. Um, this is intended to be a, a tool used by fire agencies, especially those that are applying uh, MWPA funds to mitigate hazards in the community. Th this is intended to give us a picture of how individual parcels and the structures and the building envelope in, in uh, the community affects relative hazards. Um, this is not necessarily a, 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 a intended to be a picture where you, you zoom in and feel comfortable that your house is in a yellow zone. Um, uh, th this is intended to help us make decisions about the best places to apply mitigation measures and to help identify some of the, the neighborhoods that are particularly at risk. Um, I'm not picking on Kentfield here. Well, I think Chief Pomey's here. This, I just happened to be zoomed in on Kentfield, but it's one of the communities that we, we've recognized for a long time has significant risk. And this is an analysis that looks at things like the building age um, the building site locations, whether buildings are located in a drainage or at the top of a ridge or, or uh, mid slope, looks at a whole variety of factors, uh, how the building's built, the amount of structure, the, the number of square feet of structure that could be exposed to heat and embers. And it analyzes all of this with the fire behavior based on the vegetation in the community and gives us a picture that helps us better uh, isolate and choose locations for future uh, mitigation measures. Um, I really encourage everybody to take a look at this. I think it's a you know, much more engaging document and the ability to, to uh, play with these maps, look at it and better, better look at the fine grained detail is, is really helpful. Um, any questions uh, about the document or how we can find it? Todd, if you could just go ahead and stop the screen share so we can get back to... Yeah. Face to face. Very good. Um, Todd, thank you very much for that um, update. Um, and so that the public knows it is accessible now. My, I also understand that the document has not yet gone to the Board of Supervisors. Um, and Jason, I, I believe that date was February 2nd. I thought I had heard. Maybe you know um, when they're going to take a look at it. But I believe that, that one of the last things to happen is that they accept the report. Um, this, this report 
I believe is used as part of the um, hazardous, um, oh, what is it called? One of the elements for the um, mitigation plan. Hazard mitigation plan. And uh, so as the Board of Supervisors accepts it, it may be something for the city and town managers to take note of. They may want to also uh, have presentations at their uh, board meetings um, so that they can understand this, that it can become a part of their hazard mitigation plan as well um, with all the current up updates. So does anyone have any questions for Todd on the CWPP? Chief Mayor? Hi, uh, yes, I'd just like to find, um, thank you for sharing that information. Uh, I was just uh, curious again, I wanna present some information to some of the commissions and boards um, that I'm charged with. And I wanted to give them the direct link or access to how to get to a story map. And I wasn't really clear on that. Is that something when you go to Fire Safe Marin's website, you just see that click on there? Yeah, it, it's relatively easy to find, firesafemarin.org slash CWPP. Um, and on that page, the story map itself is embedded directly, and there are two links at the top of the page that will take you right to it. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions for Todd? Bill, if I may, not just not really a question, but I just want to reiterate what Todd mentioned for the parcel level risk assessment and using that as a tool for the ops committee to prioritize the works for the core project. Um, it's one of the most powerful tools we have available, um, not just for us, but the statewide. It's an amazing tool that we've created. Yeah, I, I think that's a really unique analysis. Uh, you know, it's an approach that we, we uh, in, in a lot of ways invented here. Um, I, it's relevant only to Marin County and the way we've done this analysis, but we're, we incorporated the best science, uh, you know, that, that had really fantastic help from the, the, the current science community on, on developing this. And I think you're gonna see this type of analysis expand beyond Marin. I, I'm sure that you're gonna see other communities take a similar approach going forward. And we, we hope that we'll be able to compare changes over time. So, uh, uh, you know, it, we'll probably see two more revisions of the CWPP during the life of MWPA. And it, I, I think it's gonna be really valuable for us to, to use this data to compare the change over time. Thank you, Todd. Any other questions for Todd from the panel? Okay, uh, Allison, if, would we have another one? Allison, would you like to, or can you check the uh, audience, please? I'm looking for any raised hands from our audience members, and there is no public comment. Thank you, Allison. Okay, very good. Um, moving down the agenda, the 2020 work plan, um, and I think uh, I've seen some recent requests go out uh, for some updates. Jason, do you have anything that you can share with the group on that? Yeah, just as a reminder, we're uh, halfway through the year and uh, I, I did distribute an Excel document and ask that each agency update uh, the list of projects that were submitted as part of the 2021 or 2020 work plan, which was essentially this fiscal year we're currently in. Uh, with that, if you have anticipated changes to projects, either a project was unable to be completed or you're not going to be able to complete it or you've changed and reprioritized that we ask that you just uh, complete the, the the 2020 work plan items uh, and and forward those to mark um, so we can make sure that they're included uh, as part of the documents and transparency on the website uh, so i'd ask that uh, by next friday agencies uh, submit their updates to the list of projects that were included in that work plan or any modifications. If you're eliminating a project and, and moving it for whatever reason, uh, that'd be done. We would like to be able to provide that update to Mark so he can bring it to the board. Subsequently, can bring it back to this committee <coughs> uh, and take a look at things. So again, we're about halfway through the year. Uh, there has been an enormous amount of work done already, um, but we do want to make sure that uh, uh, we're transparent and posting uh, current status of all projects. Uh, so if you can get those to me by next Friday, that would be awesome. And I will give kudos to Rich Shortall for already submitting uh, for his two agencies he's responsible for. So he beat everybody as an overachiever. And I'll, I, I have nobody else to shame because the rest 16 of us are still, I'm still waiting on myself included. Thank right. you. Bill. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate that. Any questions from the board here? the ops group. 
for Jason. Okay. I'm um, seeing now. What I would just mention um, is that I know there is a there's a, a real desire to be able to get this information um, up on a website uh, that that has a, a public facing dashboard that would allow people to see the status of the projects. Um, and I know that's being worked on. And, and as soon as we can get that completed, uh, I think that will be a, a helpful tool for everyone. So uh, coming soon. Um, so why don't we go out to, uh, Allison, can you go out and see if any questions from the public on the work plan? I'm looking for any raised hands from our audience members and there's no public comment. Thank you, Allison. Uh, so bringing it back, we'll look at the next item. It's the uh, Fire Safe Marin work plan update. So within the work plan itself, Fire Safe Marin had a, a broad uh, amount of uh, public education, other projects and programs. and. Uh, we're gonna get an update now from Rich on those. Great, thanks Chief. Um, I'll do a share screen if you don't mind. So I'll try to go through this pretty quickly because you, you probably see this every month. Um, it changes every week or two because we're pretty busy and we've got a lot of projects, but I do wanna highlight the webinar that we just had this Tuesday night. Um, it featured Chief Tyler speaking about um, fire adaptive communities and Todd Lando, who's also on this meeting, speaking about uh, uh, actions you can take to protect your home at the last minute of a fire is coming. And then once again, Steve Quarles talking about some of the more exotic active strategies, sprinklers and gels and whatnot. And I really wanna highlight it because it was a particularly good webinar. So it's posted on our website. I really encourage you to take a look at it. And the best thing was on a rainy night in January, and a lot of people would not consider fire season, the attendance was really very good. We had people from all over the state watching this webinar. I, I think the word's getting out and they're successful because of people like the chief and Todd and Steve and others. So next month be talking about Grand Zero, Ground Zero. Todd and uh, Steve will be back. I think I'm gonna try to get Chief Tyler back every month because he was a big hit. So we'll look forward to more of that. Um, we will be doing workshops next spring. I'll be talking with each with you more about that. Meanwhile, we're working with Northern California landscape professionals on a, pro on a training project for them. And then we have something that we're partnering with uh, UC Davis team for a home hardening contract. I won't get into a lot of detail about this. Um, we were really happy with the Get Ready Fifth Grade project. It came out, went really well. We gave it to the Marin County Board of Education and they're piloting the program now. Initial feedback was really positive. Um, the kids really seemed to like it. Lots of educational materials, we keep doing that. Um, really proud of the fact that we did a lot of translation in the Spanish language. Our website has the Google Translate feature, so you can really have any language. If you've never played with that, it's kind of an amazing thing. And the translation is surprising. Uh, we translated our evacuation checklist. We even did videos in Spanish and English and whatnot. And we're really happy because we were just awarded the uh, Listos Outreach Toolkit from California Fire State Council, uh, Spanish language educational materials, and three thousand dollars in discretional discretionary funding for the project. I've been working with uh, Quinn over at San Rafael Fire Department to kind of prior figure out exactly how we're going to do the outreach, taking advantage of those materials. So we're really glad we got that grant. Um, we are participating in uh, Mark Brown's committee, which is working on developing the next round of training for the WIMS. And it's not really, we're not here to set the uh, agenda for that, but we wanna offer any support we can for materials and so forth that might be needed for that. We continue to uh, support the Firewise communities that we keep growing probably every month. We add one or two more, we're up over 70 right now. And we've came up with a new thing, which we call it the standard activity list for Firewise sites. It's a little bit different than the strict NFP requirement, but it's designed so that when you think about either joining the program or you're part of it, you have a clearer idea of what are the things that you can be doing in your community that are not particularly burdensome and a way to get yourselves better prepared and better organized. So um, it's been received pretty well and we want to start putting into a practice immediately. Our website's always being updated and if you haven't had a chance to look at our YouTube channel, it's amazing. We now have over 70 
videos on there, many that we produced ourselves, uh, many that we linked to, lots of different content. It's pretty exciting. We're developing kind of, there's so much of it now, we need to develop a better uh, directory to find things on there. And we just started production on a couple of new videos. One is a field assessment guide for firewise leaders so that they can walk in the neighborhood from the street and get a better sense of what the status of things are. Um, we're working with Nick Tippin um, on a Native American land management techniques video that kind of highlights prescribed burns as part of the management techniques that were used in the past by Native Americans, along with some of the other things they do around the land. Should be a very exciting uh, video and it'll be both for adults and kids. And then um, I think it's kind of important. A lot of people don't really know what to expect when a home evaluation comes along. When we had our um, webinar on Monday, I was surprised at the number of questions we got from people that were really worried that they were gonna get some kind of citation and they kind of wanted to avoid the program if they could. We want people to understand just how supportive it is and get an idea of what it's gonna be like when one of the wildfire mitigation specialists shows up at the house. Um, really good about getting back to people. We got the newsletter going out. I hope you're all subscribers. I assume you are. Um, we're working with Mark Brown to help the NWA craft a new communication strategy, which I think will be very good. Uh, we have a team that's been doing that for us, We're kind of in transition mode right here now, but um, I think that'll be a very positive thing. The MWPA has a great story to tell and anything we can do to help to get that message out, we're very much in favor. We're doing a fire fire landscape demonstration garden in Sleepy Hall. It's kind of a big project. We're sort of excited about it. UC Marin Master Gardeners is auditing the project and our goal is to create sort of a planning template for future demonstration gardens. I think you all know this, the toughest for trying to get people to make a change to their landscape is they can never picture what it's gonna look like if they re remove the juniper or whatever the problem is. So I think there's a lot of value to these and they need to be shown in context. So you need to have a fairly big plot to make it work. The radios out there, that's going pretty well. Um, I really want to pause. I'm going to come back to the chipper program. I'll say something about red sign, then I want to conclude with the chipper. Um, it's taken forever, but finally the first prototype of the flip sign, which is quite a change from what we had in the, in the past, is ready. I'm actually going to pick it up tomorrow or Monday, and then we'll call our team back together to take a look at it to see what everybody thinks about it. I think this will be a really important, very valuable tool for major roadways all around the county they can display messages when it's not warning times that could be changed. And then when it's time to, when the red flag warning is happening, we can easily flip them up and then people realize they need to go into the, take the steps necessary to accommodate that. So the last one I wanna talk about is the chipper program. For those who haven't, uh, a really pretty comprehensive report on the program from last year. It's on our website and the, MWP board has some hard copies of it, but it's quite detailed. And I think it makes the point that the chipper program was very successful, very well received, but they're kind of complicated. Um, so we formed a planning team with representatives from each of the five zones and our staff, Mark Brown and so forth, to come up with a proposal for next year's chipping. And when I say next year, I really mean this year because we plan to start in May. Um, it'll be a more comprehensive proposal that will take the remainder of this year to start a program, then the entire fiscal year for MWP next year. Um, it'll be more aggressive, coordinated countywide. And what I'm hoping to be able to do is next month is to come back to the operations committee here with a full presentation about it, to get your input in on it and um, your recommendations and then hopefully at that point, we can forward it to the full board for their March meeting so that we can get approved to take all the steps necessary to be ready to start chipping in May. And there's quite a few things to do and I'll get into the, all of that at a future meeting. So with that, I'm glad to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Rich. Uh, Darren has a question. Hi, Rich. Thank you for all the excellent work that 
you and Fire Safe Marine personnel are continuing to do um, is phenomenal. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, just for those individuals uh, who have not subscribed to the monthly newsletter, can you give me uh, the steps or the information or the location they should go to so that I can put them towards being subscribers? <laughs> Great. Uh, two things. One is the easiest way is go to the Fire Safe Marin website, firesafemarin.org, and right on the landing page is a big red square about how to sign up for that. But I will also personally send to you a separate link so that you have that in addition. That's great, thank you. And then lastly, I, I, I know the chipper program has been hugely successful and maybe this is a question that's better served for the round table. Um, but I, I, I have an interest in air curtain burners as being valuable tools, both the portable models and some of the less portable models. And I just wondered, was that something you had ever explored or considered as an alternative or a supplement to, to actually chipping? So I am familiar with the, uh, those burners. I think they're a great tool. And I think that, I think their application is, uh, is best deployed in more of, for what I'll call sort of more space areas where you're out there, you're, you're doing fuel management and you have a place where you can um, efficiently uh, burn the material, create the biochar and not create a lot of smoke and so forth. Um, for the, for what we're doing, we would have to set up basically a whole brand new infrastructure that probably couldn't, uh, handle anywhere near the capacity that we're bringing in each day, unless we had quite a bit of it out there. But I do think it's a very important tool and we're really not using it. I think it does have several places where it's a good application. Great. Thank you. Anyone else with questions for Rich? All right, Rich, thank you very much. Let's, uh, Allison, can you go to the public, please? I'm waiting for any raised hands from our audience members. And there's no public comment. Great, thank you very much. Um, next item up is the, the basically 2020 budget update. And just let me say, um, as we talk about this and then looking at the next item, which is where we'll uh, begin to set up the ad hoc committees for the work plan and the budget committee. The, these subcommittees that we do are ad hoc. They're, they're built for um, a specific purpose. The work is done um, and then basically they disband. And so um, there is not uh, an expectation in this update that, that we hear all the ins and outs of the budget. But I did ask uh, Chief uh, Tubbs who was chairing the committee at the time uh, I think we call it finance, not necessarily budget committee, but um, uh, if you could just talk a little bit about uh, what they did last time. And as we begin to think about uh, what still might need to be done. Um, so uh, Chris, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Yeah, thanks Bill. And um, I'll certainly cover the work that the ad hoc committee completed before we were disbanded and, and perhaps Mark uh, might want to add some details at the end since his transition into the executive officer role. Uh, so I think as everyone recalls last year, uh, the ops committee established this finance subcommittee to support the development of the first year's budget. And the members on that committee included myself, uh, Chief Pomey and town managers Joe Chin and to Todd Cusimano. And uh, uh, some of the things that we did include, we worked with Roy Givens um, to clarify the property tax revenues, revenue estimates, and then uh, a number of questions around borrowing and lending uh, options and, and costs associated with the lending. So I think everyone knows that the property tax disbursements come, first one comes in uh, December, followed by uh, one in April and the final one in June. And the, a lot of questions from the local agencies regarding uh, the, the gap between the July, beginning of the fiscal year in July 1 and the, and the disbursement in December. So our committee was really tasked with sort of trying to provide some um, options and recommendations to the ops committee. Um, uh, so we did that. We developed uh, that plan regarding cash flow. Uh, we reached out to each of the agencies to find out, you know, who uh, had the capacity to fund, sort of self-fund themselves until the December disbursement. But one of the things that came out of that 
was the recognition that we didn't want that cycle to repeat every year. And ultimately the executive uh, uh, board uh, recommended uh, holding back some of the funding primarily out of the core functions uh, area, build up a bit of a reserve. So we sort of got into, we could get into this pattern of uh, normalizing the finances. Uh, in addition to that, uh, knowing that we were in the process of bringing on an executive officer and not wanting him to be you know, completely overwhelmed, uh, we worked on a number of baseline finance policies that we could uh, forward to the executive board for their um, uh, review and ultimately hopefully the adoption, uh, which did occur. So we had, uh, before Mark came on board, we had a number of real um, basic baseline, probably a dozen, I think, uh, finance policy documents ready for them and, and ready for Mark. Um, everyone, I believe, has received the first of the property tax disbursements, which should be 50% of the overall funds uh, the, that's gone out to the local agencies. Again, the next disbursements are going to be in April, which is 45% in June and, and the final 5%. Um, though not directly related to the Finance Committee, uh, I think everyone is aware that the Southern Marin Fire District has a administrative and finance support services uh, agreement with the MWPA. So um, our finance manager uh, provides that um, accounting piece for the MWPA, runs all the reports, um, does all of the banking and all of those kinds of things. Uh, again, this was a, an important piece of work prior to Mark's arrival. We had to set up um, not only all of the bank accounts, uh, but we had to comply with all the regulatory uh, elements of starting up this agency. Um, so there was a lot of work put into the finance management systems and processes and so on and so forth. And I just wanna take a moment to thank um, uh, our, our finance manager, Elisa Schiffman and Jean Bonander, who stepped in as the interim uh, director. She was just tremendous in helping us uh, get to uh, that point. Um, there still are a number of issues to refine and work through, uh, including so uh, estimates of our anticipated revenue for this next fiscal year. Um, I think it was alluded to earlier, uh, agency accounting uh, for the 2020-2021 fiscal year related to defensible space inspection program and local mitigation. A again, we want to ensure that those funds that are um, allocated are being spent uh, as they're supposed to and anything that's not being allocated is rolled over into the subsequent year, but this is all being tracked very clearly for transparency purposes. Um, continued support to the operational plan um, subcommittee as they uh, build out their plans. We want to help support that uh, with uh, providing accurate um, estimates. The continued development, we believe there's going to be additional financial policies as we mature as an organization. And then ultimately, again, any other needs of the executive officer. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Mark for anything that I may have missed. Thanks, Chris. And I do, I do want to thank the work that happened prior to my arrival and what the work that the operations committee's finance ad hoc subcommittee did because they really did more work than just focus on the core uh, budget, which is really where you guys are going to be able to focus this year, but they also set up the, the, the financial structure for the entire organization. And it's one that's working. We've only had to make a few changes to the way it was organized. And that was only because we're understanding our financial systems better now through trial and error. And when it came to the budget allocations you've made, we've only had to make three adjustments to the budget. Um, and only one of them was in an upward budget uh, adjustment. The others were one that was approved because uh, the chipper program was doing so well and we needed to have more days, but then they ended up coming in under budget. And then our lease with Southern Marin, we were actually coming in under budget. So great job for the onset when it came to the financial policy development um, because of the work that had been done before, we only had to create one policy from scratch and that was the disbursement policy. So um, it really did help. And then like Chris said, we are, or as I mentioned earlier, and when, one, one adjustment for Chris, what Chris said is it's 55%, 40%, then 5%. Um, I keep trying to go 55, 45, and five and get 105 for the MWPA, but uh, the county box at that. Um, but um, hey, we got to try. So um, the, those 55% allocations did come in a little bit higher than anticipated, um, which is great news, right? And so we are going to use the actuals of this year for the projected next year. We don't see much change occurring. 
And then that'll allow us to identify what the 60% is for the core, subtract out what the admin portion of it is, and then be able to give you guys, all right, this is, these are your thresholds for your budgeting purposes. And um, Lisa has been working on a formula on what the revenues are for each of the five geographical areas. So you guys will have a benchmark of what the um, each gener which area is generating how much money. So we can stick to that 80% as close as possible. And a report. Okay, excellent. Thank you both, uh, Chris and Mark. Do we have any questions from the ops committee here? Okay, very good. Uh, Allison, can you please check the uh, public? Looking for any raised hands from our audience members and there is no public comment. Thank you, Allison. Um, okay, we are uh, getting towards the home stretch here. <clears throat> and then item 12 is broken into two uh, different uh, actions, but I think we, we're gonna make a couple of slates here and then uh, can vote on them. Um, the first is uh, the creation of an ad hoc work plan subcommittee. Um, I put down, you know, five members um, uh, only because, you know, it was to try to have an odd number. Um, last year on our um, work plan committee, we had authorized up to eight members. Um, it was a mix of operations committee folks. Uh, we only officially filled seven of the eight positions. Um, and that was with, um, I think it was uh, Schutz, White, Shortall, Schwartz, Tubbs, Tyler, and Weber. And then we had a couple of other folks uh, help like Tom Welch, I think Quinn Gardner uh, and others. Uh, that helped inform that process. Um, but uh, anyway, the, the number of five does not have to be, the, the final number could be more. Um, so, you know, what we anticipate is, we, we really have two jobs as a, as a uh, ops committee. We have to come up with a work plan that we're gonna recommend to the executive uh, board and we have a budget that we need to, to recommend that that uh, will fund that. Those are, those are our two main objectives. So um, having said that, um, we need to try and build a slate. So I'm wondering if there's anyone that would like to volunteer. Uh, I would say also it's likely important that we get at least one person from each of the zones um, uh, represented on that um, as a way to, to kind of keep some structure around it. Um, you, you know, because we now this time around have the advisory technical committee, much of the work of creating the actual plan, uh, programs and projects will come from that group up to us. And so um, there, there may be, you know, what we kind of envision for this is that, you know, we uh, be very interactive with the um, advisory technical committee, that as they bring these things forward, we look at them, we make sure that, um, you know, they, they meet the goals that are set by the executive committee in terms of the vision, mission and values. Um, we had re made recommendations on a um, fire adaptive community with a house out approach. Um, and uh, that there's justifications that the, um, the um, uh, ec ecological impacts uh, were all taken into consideration and done properly. All of these sorts of things I can envision this committee, you know, looking at, making sure that they're complete when they come up. I don't see this as a committee uh, that is, uh, you know, like Caesar, you know, saying down or yes like that. It's moreover that we make sure that they're conforming uh, to what, what they need to be. Um, that the, they match up with the funds that are available and it's done within the timeframes uh, so that we can move it along and get it all adopted uh, by the executive committee uh, before it's implemented. So that's kind of what I see as the, the roles uh, of that group. Um, so with that, um, are there uh, folks that would like to volunteer uh, as we form this slate from this group? I'm happy to help, Bill. Okay, that's Jason. I'll save you the exciting finance stuff for the city managers. Ah, <laughs> Bill, I'd like to suggest Tom Welch from the Southern Marin region. Okay. Rich, I'm uh, wondering if you're going to want to be on, on the group. Um... Yeah, I'm glad to help. I just was kind of holding back in case somebody else wanted to do it. But if not, I'd be glad to help out. And, and Bill, before we get too far, I, I, I can interject for you as the chair, you can um, assign the ad hoc without having to go to a vote. Um, I should have caught that for you earlier. And um, 
um, <laughs> Keith Welch can um, participate as a um, advisory type position, but since he's not on the op ops committee, technically he can't be in the ad hoc committee, but he so, could be there for support. So he'd be advisory too. Yeah. Okay. Um, do, you, do, you have one, do you have anyone for my zone already? Nope, not yet. Go ahead and uh, insert me there. Okay, Darren, you're on. I'm gonna add myself on as well. And then Bill, if, I, if Dave, Garrett or Joe aren't interested, I'm happy to do it. I owe Dan Schwartz for making him the uh, vice president of this group. So <laughs> I was gonna nominate him, but I think he would kill me. <laughs> so if no one else is interested, I'm happy to represent. Okay, Todd, I'll add you to the group. One, two, three. That's five. That's sort of our, our minimum. I Looking at this list, I, I think uh, from the South, I mean, well, it's actually four members plus uh, Tom would be on there. Um, yeah, Bill, you can you can put me on there. I, I guess I was just trying not to straddle the, the two committees. All right, and name only, Chris. <laughs> but we know who's going to do the work. Yeah. Okay. So I've got uh, Jason, Chris, Darren, uh, myself, and Todd, with uh, Tom pensioning for Chris. Is there anyone else that would like to be on that slate? Okay, let's. That's uh, slate A. Let's build out slate B uh, before we go to the public then uh, to try and streamline. This is the uh, basically the finance committee um, that will help you know go between the executive board um, uh, and making sure that as they we interact with the uh, the work plan group that uh, the funding is. Uh, Correct, and we're we're on track with that. Um, likely, likely less of a work product required than than the last time round. Um, and Chris gave a good explanation of, of what they did last time. So, can I get uh, some members on the slate for uh, the finance committee? And again, last time it was uh, Chief Pomey, Chief Tubbs, uh, Todd Cusimano, um, and uh, Garrett. No, and Joe Chen were on there last time. I'm good being on again. Joe, thank you. I am too. Chris? Yeah, I'm no, I will to, too. That's Mark. Chief Pomey, thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to help out if needed to uh, Eric with Marin would help Santa Fe area there. Eric, that's great. All right, so I've got Joe, uh, Chris, Chief Pomey, and uh, Eric. Any, anyone else like to add their name? Certainly help out if you need a fifth. Alan, why don't we uh, put you on there too? Okay, so those are the two slates then. Um, we've got, uh, we've got uh, on slate one again, it's Jason, Chris, Darren, myself and Todd. And then for the finance, it's Joe, Chris, uh, Mark Pomey, Eric and Alan. Um, any, any last comments before we go to the public? Okay, um, so why don't I get, can I get, a, uh, can I get a motion and a second and then we'll go to the public? So I think you can point without a motion a second was Mark was saying earlier. Yeah, yeah no, I get, I get Eric, it. Eric helped me out on that. You get the voluntold. I would, I would like input from the public on it. So why don't we just do it this way for now and uh, you can chide me later for it or whatever, but. Um, so I don't see any more comments. Let's, uh, Allison, can you check the public, see if they have a comment on it? I'm looking for any raised hands from our audience members and there's no public comment. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So uh, with the powers invested in me in the state of California under whatever, this and that, I, uh, I so appoint everybody. I feel, that's, I feel powerful. Ops committee bylaws. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. All right, very good. Um, let's see here. All right, uh, we're in the home stretch. Item 13 is uh, information only. Does Do any of the members have an information item that they'd like to share with everyone? Okay, uh, seeing none, uh, do we have to go to public for information items, questions? No, you don't. Okay. Uh, Next one is committee members request for future agenda items. 
something that is there anything you guys would like to add? Darren? I, I was curious as to whether or not the group would benefit from a presentation from any uh, particular company that might want to demonstrate their product, the air curtain burner that I spoke with earlier, either the small model that's portable or the larger model that Rich kind of referred to that you might want to put out in the open spaces and let's sit uh, and bring materials over to that, that uh, larger construct, if you will. That sounds good to me. Um, we'll go ahead and add that, Darren. Um, I'll get some. I'll get some specific uh, information from you, and we'll add it to the agenda for next time if they're available. Very okay. good. Sounds okay. Sounds. Anything else on the agenda? Okay. And I do want to go out to the public, Allison. Is there something from the public that they would like to see us uh, tackle? I'm looking for any raised hands from our audience members. Larry Manikas, uh, you may unmute yourself. Just uh, briefly to Darren White's remark, if, if you do a demo, it'd be interesting if, you could, if, if it's possible and safe to invite uh, members of the public to see these demos so we know what kind of things you might be looking at, get ahead of it sort of thing. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Looking Darren, can I clear? Yes, Darren, uh, I just want to clarify, this would be a demo via video, like a presentation of the product that we're able to look at by Zoom as an example, not an actual in-person demo. Got it. Okay. Next. All right, everyone. Uh, oh, we have another raised hand, it looks like. Yes, our next public comment. Oh, uh, I'll ask if our commenter OFA Moran would like to comment to raise their hand. Okay, it does look like no more public comment. Thank you so much. <laughs> And on the other hand, it does look like public comment. What's that? I'm sorry, the hand keeps raising and lowering. So perhaps I will ask them to unmute themselves in case they need to make a comment and are having an issue with the hand. Yes, this is Bill Cole. Go ahead, Bill. Hi. I, I just wanted to say that um, at, a, at a recent ESP uh, carbon Resource Management Committee meeting, we had a, a specialist on uh, biochar who made a, a wonderful presentation on just the subject that uh, Darren White was talking about. So, uh, and we've had two of these. So I just thought, uh, Bill, I'd just pass on the, the, the background on that and the slides that came forward and you might find those useful. I appreciate that, Bill. Thank you very much. You can feel free to send it to me or you can call me later and we can talk and then we'll tie Darren in and make sure it gets captured. I know you guys are doing great work out there. Okay, so that brings us to uh, adjournment. Um, can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. All right. And I know we all miss Jason and is uh, running the meetings and everything. So Jason, uh, you know, this is faster than I think I've ever done. So I'm impre know, thoroughly impressed and we got more accomplished. I don't know about that. Great, uh, Chief Tyler, thank you for doing it and taking on the role. Yeah. Good work. Yeah, no, ha happy to help. Um, and I just want to let you guys know, I got a text from Jan Dan Schwartz. He wanted to be with us. He ended up uh, having uh, some sort of thing he needed to deal with at home. He's fine, but just uh, wanted to let us know uh, that he is thinking of us. So we are thinking of him. And uh, we'll go ahead and, uh, oh, do we have, okay, we'll go ahead and, uh, did someone adjourn? I didn't, I didn't see that. I did, that was Todd. Todd, okay, Todd in a second. Second. Second, okay, all in favor, say aye. 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 Very good. We'll see you again next time. Thanks very much, everybody. Take care, everybody. Thanks, guys.